Hello, all of you. Good afternoon. I am busy trying to find out exactly what is happening in this test tube. I'm sure you know what our topic for the day is, but I'm putting some magnesium ribbon into some hydrochloric acid, and I'm adding a little bit more because I'm the ever exci excited scientist, but I feel my hands are getting extremely hot here now. Sure, that's uh, some magnesium ribbon into some uh, hydrochloric acid. And I feel that heat is coming out of this reaction. Now you're guessing what we're gonna talk about today. On the other hand, I want to try another experiment because I'm in experimentation mood today, you can call it that. Uh, let's see if I take another test tube and I've added some orange juice to it, normal orange juice. You know, I bought a bottle along the way and I added, and then I think I'm going to add a little bit of this bicarbonate we call it, or sodium bicarbonate. I'm going to add a little bit to it, some orange juice, and I'm doing my own preparation experiments here today just to find out what exactly happens here. And I'm feeling this, sure, it's getting quite cold. Sure, I can't show you with a thermometer right now, but it's cooling down, and I'm sure I'm going to have some very cold orange juice after this, after the show. That you can be sure of. So the question is, do you know what my topic for the day is? O o one was getting slightly hot, and the other one getting very, very cold. I'm actually cooling my orange juice that way around. Yes, of course, our topic is chemical change, and specifically energy in chemical changes, as you see it on our screen right now. Now, if you watch carefully on the screen, you will notice there that it says chemical change, and this topic normally in the examination has four subsections. The first one is energy and chemical change, and that is where we'll be focusing today. The second part of this part of the syllabus, which is uh, called chemical change, is normally the one which you'll be hearing from as rates of chemical reactions. And then the third one, uh, the so-called reversible reactions or equilibrium. And then of course, there's always the last one, electrochemical reactions. That section on chemical change normally accounts for up to 75 marks. The four sets I've just shown you, 75 marks in the final examination. And today we're gonna master the very first topic of energy and chemical change. Let's go to our screen and see what is the plan for today. First of all, we will look at energy change, like heat coming out in endothermic and exothermic reactions and heat going into exothermic and endothermic reactions. And we are just going to ask you, what are your observations and what are the characteristics of these kind of reactions? Those are the endothermic ones and exothermic ones. And then we're gonna do one or two calculations. Thereafter, we look at the graphs and of course, you as a learner will be active throughout the session. I will refer you to some pages in your work as well as I will be asking you questions as we go along. And at the end, you will have to do activity 5.1 on pages four and five of your work. So let us quickly get into, and let me ask you one or two questions before we actually start the day's work. First of all, if I go back, to uh, my two test tubes here. This one was getting rather, rather hot. So what kind of reaction would you classify it as? Heat, hot means that the energy is coming from the experiment, from the chemicals to my hand. So what is the direction? That's right, it is outwards, from the chemicals to my hand, exothermic. That's where we go to. The question is, where does this energy come from? That is the basic question we have to answer this afternoon. If I take the other test tube, which I had earlier on, the one with my orange juice and my sodium bicarb or sodium hydrogen carbonate, then I find it's getting cool. It's even colder now than it was before. And then what do I find? That the heat from my hand, heat from outside from my hand is going into the chemicals inside this test tube. So this one would then be called endothermic, exothermic. You take your guess. 
Of course, it's endo, the heat is going into the chemicals inside the test tube. Okay, so let's just look at a slide again to reinforce those two ideas. First of all, look at this one. Let's say the room temperature is 25 degrees and I have a test tube and it cools down to five degrees. Ah, I see someone from a, one of the schools that said, this is definitely endothermic and I'm glad that you people are responding. Someone sit on the left hand side. You are dead right, Lennis. I'm glad that all of you are wide awake. This is endothermic because the heat is going from the environment, from the surroundings, into the chemicals inside. And the arrows are showing, so that is endothermic. But the question is, where does, where is the heat going to, or what is going on inside? And I'll come back to that in a minute or two. And the other test tube, let me see the other one. If I open the other one for you, that one, that one which got hotter from 25 up to 45 degrees, what would you say? What kind of reaction was that one? Endothermic, exothermic? I'm sure the arrows is giving it away here. Yes, the heat was going out of the system, out of the system of chemicals. The heat is given off to the surroundings and therefore we call that an exothermic. I'm saying thank you very much, school 107. We see a secondary school and Princeton. Yes, thank you very much. I'm getting everybody's response. Leonard, thank you very much. I simply love the way you react. Just one last thing. What is this energy that's coming in or out? We call it the heat of reaction. Exactly, that means that is the energy that comes from the total energy inside. Now, just one short explanation for you while we are busy talking about it. If I take this chemical which I have here and I put, let's say, on my orange uh, file here, and I put, then we know that these are chemicals. And these chemicals consist of many, many particles. Now, what I'm trying to tell you that if these particles of this chemical is then called a system, because a system is normally defined as one or more parts to a, a group of particles. So this is a system consisting of uh, many particles. And inside here we have energy. Well, we can talk about glucose, for instance. We know that's got a lot of energy. So that is internal energy. And the energy comes, of course, from the kinetic movement of the particles as well as the position. So we have what we would say potential energy because of position, and we have kinetic energy because of the particles, the atoms moving around all the time. That's the total energy. So the total energy of the system is normally known as the internal energy. And that internal energy plus other energies, for instance, the product of P plus V, that we'll see on page one of your notes, right at the top, it's known as enthalpy, correct? That is the term that you see right on the top of page one in your note. Make a note if you have it in front of you and mark it off. Enthalpy is the total energy and there's a formula for it and I would like you to uh, read and remember that formula. It is the total internal energy plus the product of the pressure and the volume of the system, which in this case is our substance of molecules or atoms if you want to. But what then happens is that some of that energy can change when we rearrange the, the molecules. When we make a new substance, like I'll show you now, now, we find that some of that energy go either comes out or more energy is needed to change the uh, reaction. So let me explain that idea between the reaction that happens, but I think you need to understand, ensure that you know what enthalpy means. In, in short, the total heat content of a system. That's what enthalpy is. Now, where does heat of reaction or change of enthalpy come from? Right, let's go back to our slides quickly and we'll follow up on those ideas. Now, a chemical reaction normally, we show it with a, a graph and normally I want you to note very carefully how these axes are labeled. I always tell learners whenever you're confronted with a graph, the first thing you look, the first side you look to is this side here, the so-called y-axis. 
and you always notice this potential energy. But if you go to your notes, you will notice that on page two of your notes, if you have those books, and I notice that some of these schools say that we don't have the notes. Well, I suspect, or I would suggest that those learners who don't have the notes, speak to your teacher, will contact the department and get those notes, or speak to your teacher who could possibly speak to uh, the management at the school so that they can get those notes to you as soon as possible. But let's go back to the screen. So on this axis, you will always find that we have energy involved. On page two of your notes, you will notice here that we give a range of names. Sometimes it's called chemical potential energy, other times simply just potential energy. Uh, and they don't, don't always tell you that that's the energy inside the chemicals. And on this one, you have the progress of the reaction. In other words, since the reaction starts until it ends, sh goes along this axis as you'll see now. But also you'll notice on page two that there are three other possible labels that you can use here. Sometimes they, they use the word coordinates of the reaction, and sometimes progress of reaction, and sometimes cause of reaction. And you will then notice that you can use any of those three labels along here. That's the first thing. The next two important things that I want to mention to you, and good afternoon to you, Brandon, uh, at Rockland Sci and your teachers. Uh, I'm glad, yes, someone asked me, is it always the case that we have the potential energy on the y-axis? And the answer is, of course, sometimes the examiners also just put energy on this side because they don't specify potential energy, but the correct way should be that we should have potential energy on this axis. Okay, now let's go back to the screen and let me round off the section. Next, you'll notice that we always start a reaction with reactants. And I'm sure that you know by now what the reactants are. But reactants are normally the starter products, or sorry, the starter materials, as well as, or sometimes call them the raw materials, with which you are going to do the reaction, which will react with each other, in this case methane and two oxygen molecules. And for we find that at the end we're going to make them into products which will be a totally different reaction. Up here, first of all, the first step in any reaction is to break the bonds. In other words, those bonds there, we're going to break them. Those double bonds there, we're going to break them, and then what do we get? We get the so-called activated complex, which is a temporary, unstable state of atoms. Notice, they are all loose, the bonds have been broken, they are unstable, activated means they've got a lot of energy, and they can now form either back into the reactants, or they can go this way, and then form the products. Let's go to that and see what we have here. After that, but please note that the very first step in any reaction is the bond breaking. The next step is we form new bonds and new materials. So instead of carbon just bonding with the hydrogens again, carbon would say, no, I'd like to bond with the, let's say, the oxygens, for instance, etc. So we find we have the product or the new circum new chemicals, new compounds, new molecules that we find. Look, carbon was bonded to hydrogens and he has been rearranged. Carbon is now bonded to oxygens. Look here, on this side, oxygens were only bonded to oxygens, but in the product, we now have oxygen bonded to hydrogen atoms. That means that we now have totally new substances and that is what a chemical reaction is, take, is all about. So, let me summarize for you what I'm telling you here. Number one, I am saying that in order for a reaction to progress, we need two important steps, two important steps. Step number one, we are breaking the bonds. And step number two, we are forming new bonds to form new products or new chemicals, so to speak. 
But okay, let's focus now on bond breaking. And let's do a calculation or two just to help us with that one. Follow on the slide because I think it is important that you understand the following. But can I address you for one moment? Now that you know that the chemical reaction is about forming new chemicals, new substances, or we are rearranging the reactants into new uh, substances by breaking the bonds first, and then they become all hyper and full of energy at the top, activated complex, and then they form a new compound called the products. We now have to look at what happens during the breaking of those bonds. And in fact, we do some calculations at times regarding those breaking of the bonds. Can we go back to the slides quickly? When we calculate the energies, let's say for instance, that we want to calculate how much energy do we need to use to break the hydrogen molecule? And how much energy do we need to use to break the chlorine molecule? so that we can combine the hydrogen with a chlorine each, like this is our product. We have certain tables which we sometimes get, and those tables are called the bond energies, simply, and it has a number of kilojoules in there, like in there. To break the hydrogen, hydrogen bond, for instance, we need 432 kilojoules of energy. So, what is a bond energy? Simply, the amount of energy needed to break a bond. Or also the number of energy, energy needed, the amount of energy needed to form a new bond. It would be the same amount. If you want to break a chlorine-chlorine bond or form a chlorine-chlorine bond, then of course you need 240 kilojoules. And to make a hydrogen chloride bond, to break it first of all, bond energy is all about breaking, we need so much energy, 428. 